Today, the United States Air Force has a global reach. Missions have been flown from the continental United States to the Middle East and back. Today, the U.S. Air Force has global dominance and air superiority anywhere American forces are deployed. However, it has not always been this way. The nascent United States Air Force is credited to one man and his squadron of novice pilots. Before the U.S. Air Force, the Army Air Force, before the Army Air Corps, there is the 1st Aero Squadron of the Aviation Section U.S. Signal Corps. With eight Curtis JN-3 aircraft, Squadron Commander Captain, Benja Captain Benjamin Floyds, along with 11 pilots, 82 enlisted men, was the first tactical aviation unit to become operational on March 16, 1916, when the squadron flew its first tactical mission. Floyds was born in Washington, Connecticut on December 9, 1879. He enlisted in the Army in 1899 using his older brother's birth certificate so he could fight in the Spanish-American War. After five months in Cuba, he returned home and was discharged. But in June of 99, Floyd re-enlisted in the Army under his real name and worked his way up from an infantry private to a second lieutenant in just two years. 1902 to 1905, Floyd served in the United States and the Philippines as a military infantry officer. His duties in the Philippines included pacifying and defeating local tribes, as well as being the topographical officer of his regiment. His duties were to survey and map the island. Now, Floyd's aviation career began when he was assigned to the Army's Signal School. His final thesis, titled The Tactical and Strategic Value of Dirigible Balloons and Aerodynamically Flying Machines, explained the importance aviation would play in any future conflict. He went so far as to forecast the demise of the cavalry as the primary reconnaissance arm and replacing it with the airplane. This probably didn't help his rise up the army ladder of success. Most likely because of his thesis, in 1908, Floyds was selected for the aeronautical board designated to conduct the 1908 airship and airplane acceptance trials. He was then assigned to the Aeronautical Division, U.S. Signal Corps. When he, where he operated the first dirigible balloon of the U.S. government, Floyds was getting the reputation of a can-do officer. Floyds basically taught himself to fly an airplane, and it was not until June of 1912 that he was issued his flying certificate number 140. By 1914, Floyds became squadron commander of the 1st Aero Squadron, and it was during his tenure as the squadron commander that he was able to have the right seat flyer, a pusher propeller aircraft withdrawn from army service, as unsafe to fly and replaced with the suitable tractor type propeller aircraft. November 19, 1915, Floyds was given orders to move the 1st Aero Squadron from Fort Sill, Oklahoma to Fort Sam Houston, San Antonio, Texas. This would become the first permanent base for the Army's aviation section. Now, taking the squadron's six Curtis JN 3s, commonly known as Jennies, Floyds led the 1st Aero Squadron on a successful cross country flight to San Antonio, Texas. However, they wouldn't have much time to train. On March 9, 1916, the Mexican rebel Pancho Villa attacked Columbus, New Mexico. President Wilson made the decision to go into Mexico and capture Villa. At the same time, word immediately went to the Signal Corps asking what needed to be done to prepare Floyd's force for service in Mexico. Lieutenant Colonel Samuel Reber, chief of the aviation section, reported that the 1st Aero Squadron could be shipped to Columbus almost immediately for service. Rebel was a non-flyer. He didn't understand the requirements needed to prepare a squadron for active duty or the types of plane needed to successfully complete the mission they were assigned. The 1st Aero Squadron was woefully unprepared for duty in Mexico. The Signal Corps Aviation School only had three rated pilots and five possible pilots in training that could be sent down to Columbus. The planes that the U.S. Army had in its inventory were incapable of the mission assigned. Nevertheless, Captain Floyds prepared the 1st Aero Squadron for duty in Mexico. Now, the squadron was equipped with the Curtis JN-3 Jennies by the standards of England, France, and Germany, who were at war and rapidly developing their air forces. The JN-3 was obsolete for frontline service. It had a top speed of 75 miles per hour, a service ceiling of 6,000, 5,000 feet. North Mexico's Sierra Madres mountain system, where they would be operating, had peaks as high as 12,000 feet. The JN-3 was inadequate for the mission, but it was the only plane the U.S. Army had in its inventory to do the job of scouting and reconnaissance. The squadron was short of planes, spare parts, transportation, and most importantly, pilots. Nevertheless, Floyds carried out his orders. 
March 12th, the 1st Aero Squadron dismantled and created their airplanes, and along with the squadron's transport, equipment, parts, and supplies, loaded aboard railroad cars, they steamed out at noon the following day for San Antonio. In addition to Floyd's, the pilots included Captain Townsend F. Dodd, Lieutenants Joseph E. Carberry, Thomas S. Bowen, Carlton G. Chapman, Herbert A. Darguerre, Edgar G. Gorell, Walter K. Kilner, Ira A. Rader, and Lieutenant Willis. When they arrived in Columbus, Pershing and his 40,800 men had already crossed the border into Mexico. Floyd's and his men prepared to join the column. They quickly established a camp and hauled their airplanes to a field east of town for assembly. Herbert Darguerre made the first sortie early that evening. The squadron finished assembling the airplanes on the following day. Sunday, March 19th, Floyd's received orders that he and his men were to report without delay to Pershing's headquarters at Casa Grande's. The squadron responded immediately. Shortly after 5 p.m., the eight Jennies of the 1st Aero Squadron took off. First off was Dodd and Floyd's, followed by Kilner, Degar, Bowen, Chapman, Carberry, Gorell, and Willis. The takeoffs were stomach churning, weighed down by personal gear and 34 gallons of gas. Gorell's plane just cleared a wire fence at the end of the field. He then held his breath as he watched Kilner barely skim over it. Kil Kil Kilner suffered engine failure and had to return to the field. The seven other planes successfully followed each other into the deep, uh, deepening dusk. The, the squadron's truck train, carrying most of the enlisted crew, parts, field equipment, supplies, started south just after the planes departed. Lieutenant Dodd was the only pilot in the squadron with any experience with night flying. They had no accurate maps of the area, the compasses in the planes were unreliable, and their landing field at Casa Grande would, be on, would only be lit by a bonfire. Just before takeoff, Captain Floyd gave one last order to his men. Follow the plane in front of you. Each man had to rely on his own skill and confidence to fly the mission. This was a disaster in the making. As darkness closed in, the uh, planes separated. The first four planes led by Dodd and Floyd managed to stay together, but the pitch dark forced them to land at La Ascension, about halfway to Casa Grande's. As the planes touched down, a 10-foot high cloud of dust raised by a column of cavalry blinded the pilots, who nonetheless managed to land safely. The other three pilots, due to darkness and being inexperienced with night flying, missed the landing site. Lieutenant Gorel landed 220 miles to the east of La Ascension. Lieutenant Darrière landed 30 miles south of La Ascension. Lieutenant Willis landed 135 miles south of La Ascension, completely wrecking his plane. Floyd had lost half his plane strength on the flight into Mexico. 8.30 the next morning, Floyd and his four planes took off from La Ascension, followed the Casagaran River, and by 9.30 they had arrived at what they thought was Pershing's main base. When they landed, they discovered they were still 15 miles from Pershing's headquarters at Colonna Dublin. Floyd led his squadron to Colonna Dublin as Lieutenant Bowen attempted to land his plane. A gust of wind caught his plane. It stalled at 50 feet and crashed. Luckily, Bowen only received some bruises and a broken nose. Now, one of the three missing pilots from the night before had arrived at Colonna Dublin just before Floyd's and the other three planes. Lieutenant Kilner, whose airplane was forced to return to Columbus because of engine trouble, had taken off at daybreak and made an uneventful flight to Colonna Dublin, arriving a few minutes before Floyd's contingent. The fate of the other two pilots would not be known for a few days. Pershing immediately ordered Floyd's and his men to get to work. He ordered a reconnaissance along the Mexican Northwestern Railroad south towards Cumbrae Pass in the Sierra Madres Mountains. Dodd and Floyd's flew this mission, taking off at noon. They proceeded only about 25 miles when they ran into trouble. The Sierra Madres rose about 10,000 feet in that area and featured jagged peaks and rugged canyons that intensified the wind's effect. The underpowered JM-3s were already operating at close to their maximum altitude and could barely exceed their stalling speed, especially with an observer aboard. The airplane, the airplane shook maddeningly, bucketed up and down frantically in the turbulent air. Dodd had to keep the nose down to sufficiently maintain speed to prevent a stall, and the constant loss of altitude prevented any attempt to cross the foothills. After an hour, Dodd and Floyd's returned to base, where Floyd's reported failure. Pershing sent a message to General Funston, 
who is the overall commander of the expedition, reporting that the day's events and the loss of aircraft. The punitive expedition person reported needed more robust planes with more powerful engines. Funston's comments on the situation reflected the ignorance of a ground officer located far from the field of operation. Funston responded, I am unable to understand the difficulties of flying of airplanes in view of the fact that these machines were fly flying daily here at San Antonio at great altitudes. Funston's failure to realize Feloy's base at Casa Grande's was a full mile above sea level that the passes connecting the Casa Grande's and the Galena Valley's range between 6,000 and 7,000 feet and that Cambrai Pass laid about 9,000 feet. All of these altitudes were higher than most of the Army pilots had ever flown. And as for non-flyers, Funston undoubtedly had little knowledge of the effects of thinner air on lift. The altitude in that part of Mexico, compounded by the radical temperatures and extreme unpredictable winds, presented a serious obstacle to Feloy's first aero squadron. For the next 10 days, Feloy and his men managed to fly reconnaissance missions, deliver dispatches, and fly in 50 pounds of supplies to a column of cavalry in the field. But it was obvious the first aero squadron was given an assignment that it could not be completed with the planes it had. On March 30th, Feloy submitted a proposal for the use of the 1st Aero Squadron, which recognized the limits of its six airplanes. He presented Pershing with four options. First, the squadron was to maintain communications by air between Columbus and the Punitive Expedition's main base at Casa Grande's, El Valley and Nanaquipa, through a system of regular flights. The plan dedicated all six planes to maintaining communications between bases and left none to scout for Pershing's roving columns as they were working their way south. The second option was for the squadron to abandon communications by airplane with Columbus, establish fuel bases at Casa Grande's, El Valley, and a location south of Nema Quipa to be selected later and concentrate all six planes uh, from that base. Two planes would maintain daily communications between Nampiqua and Casa Grande and two others would do the same with El Valley. The third option involved the 1st Aero Squadron more directly in Pershing's operations. All airplanes would concentrate at Nama Quipa and would be used to communicate with Pershing's advanced troops as they marched south. The fourth option, all airplanes would concentrate at the front for reconnaissance when the troops came in contact with the enemy. Pershing approved Feloy's third option on April 1st. The 1st Aero Squadron continued to move deeper into Mexico. The daily pattern of operations consisted of five of the six airplanes delivering mail and dispatches, while the mechanics overhauled the sixth plane on the ground. However, bad weather restricted operations. Carberry and Feloy's flew from Colonna Dubai to El Valley, landing near the 1st Aero Squadron's truck train in Mexico, but on return flight, ran into a blizzard in the mountains. Blinded by the snow, Carberry narrowly missed flying directly into a mountain. They landed the plane at Puerto Escondido, took off again, but were finally forced down at the small village of Espendalino, about 25 miles from Colonia de Blay. The two aviators spent the night with me. The winter weather continued to affect squadron operations. On the following morning, a severe snowstorm forced Daguerre to land on a mountain plateau from San Geronimo to Colonia Dubai. He did so without damage and then continued his mission after the storm had passed. The grounded Feloys and Garberry reached Colonia Dubai in a Mexican wagon. Dubois then flew Cranberry back to where his plane was to retrieve it. Despite the weather, for the next fortnight, even with inadequate planes and supplies, Feloys continued to do what he could with what he had. It was decided that the planes would be used to carry mail and dispatches between U.S. ground units and reconnaissance flights. Feloy's even pressed his transportation trucks in transporting supplies to the ground units. The 1st Aero Squadron's most dangerous mission occurred on April 7th. Pershing supplies were, were running dangerously low. Resupply by the regular channels would take too long. So Pershing ordered Feloy's to fly to Chihuahua City and request assistance from Marion Lecter, the U.S. Consul General located in the city. The local Carranistas commanders were vehemently opposed to having U.S. troops so deeply in Mexico, hostilities were ex escalating. 
To ensure that Perseus' dispatches reached the consulate, Valois decided to send two airplanes with duplicate messages. One would land south of the city and the other to the north. Once on the ground, the observer would carry the messages to the consulate while the pilots remain to protect the planes. Dagar and Falois left their base at dawn on April 7th, followed by Carberry and Dodd. The two planes headed for Chihuahua City. Carberry and Dodd landed to the north side of Chihuahua City. Dodd commandeered a carriage, which took him to the consulate without incidents. Falois and Dagar ran into a little trouble. They landed south of the city. A large crowd of hostile Mexicans began threatening the two Americans. The National Police quickly assembled to protect the pilots and the planes, or maybe not. Realizing the danger, Floyd ordered Degar to join Carberry and Dodd north of the city while he delivered the message to the consulate. As Degar lifted off, some people in the crowd opened up on his airplane with rifles. Floyd tried to intervene. He shouted at the crowd, uh, but he was arrested and placed in the city jail. The angry mob turned their attention from the plane and focused it on Floyd. The mob was several hundred strong, and it was only by luck that an American bystander saw what was happening and got word to the U.S. Consul General. After a long wait, General Luis Gutierrez gave orders that Floyd be released and agreed to place a guard over the two airplanes. Meanwhile, to the north of the town, Carberry and Dodd did not fare any better than Floyd's. Angry crowds gathered around the planes and started to burn holes in the fabric and slash the fabric with their knives. To save the planes, both pilots decided to take off and head to the American Smelter and Refining Company. Carberry got off safely, but Darguerre took off. The mob was pelting his aircraft with stones. The top section of the rear fuselage came off, damaging the stabilizer. Dagara landed safely and then stood off the crowd by himself until Floyd and the guards provided by General Gutierrez arrived. With their mission to the consulate accomplished, the first Aero Squadron continues its, uh, its mission of reconnaissance, flying, dispatches, and occasional photo reconnaissance flights. Despite having aircraft which were underpowered and unable to fulfill their mission requirements, and higher headquarters not understanding the technical problems the men had to deal with, the first Aero Squadron did amazing service in Mexico. Over the next 13 days, the number of airplanes would be whittled down by crashes. By April 14th, only two of the original eight Jennies were in flyable conditions. The first Aero Squadron was ordered back to Columbus, New Mexico by Pershing on April 20th. When they arrived, Captain Floyd determined that the two remaining Jennies were in such bad condition that he set them on fire to make sure no one could order him to fly them again. Even though they were not able to complete their full mission of locating Pancho Villa, the first Aero Squadron was able to prove the viability of aircraft as a legitimate arm of the U.S. military. During this first U.S. military air action, the 1st Aero Squadron flew 346 hours on 540 flights, covered more than 19,000 miles, performing aerial reconnaissance, photography, transporting mail, and official dispatches. More importantly, the military learned that the airplane could no longer be considered an experiment or an oddity, but could become a useful military tool. From its founding, the 1st Aero Squadron is the United States military's oldest flying unit. The squadron has maintained an unbroken heritage of over a century. Today, the designation of the 1st Air Squadron is the 1st Reconnaissance Squadron, 1RS, of the United States Air Force. From one dedicated captain and nine fledgling pilots, the world's greatest Air Force was created. Now, if you'd like to know more about the 1st Air Squadron in Mexico, their war diary from the punitive expedition has been scanned and is available online at the uh, North Texas University. Also, a very good monograph titled Preliminary to War, the First Aero Squadron and the Punitive Expedition, 1916, by Roger G. Miller. This is online at the Military Journal's Air Force History website. Now, this is our history. It's our heritage. Well, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to watch this video. If you liked it, please hit the like bell, hit the subscribe bell. Thank you very much. I put up a new video approximately every two weeks.